TTP, and welcome to our webinar today. Before we begin, there are just a few housekeeping things to note. Yes, the webinar is recorded, and both the recording and PowerPoints today will be available to you on the ITDP website. Please look out for an email from me after the webinar with all the, with all the materials. To interact with our host today, there's a Q&A box at the top or the bottom of your screen, and we ask that you submit questions throughout the presentation, and we will also answer them with our hosts at the end. I also encourage you to enter your questions there and refrain from using the chat box so that we can capture every question as it comes in. Again, thank you to everyone for joining our webinar today titled Greater Boston Bus Experiments from Pilots to Permanent Impacts. Recent bus priority pilot projects in Greater Boston have gained national prominence for the speed with which tactical interventions such as trial morning peak dedicated lanes and temporary boarding platforms have boosted the rider experience. Planned and executed, executed within six to nine months in 2018, the pilots yielded enormously positive results from speedier trips to improve reliability and increase comfort and safety. Cities across the US are starting to recognize buses as a high impact solution to improve frequent transit and increase access to jobs and other destinations across a metropolitan region. In today's webinar, the lessons from Metro Boston will provide strategic insights into how any city in the US working collaboratively with the local transit agency can demonstrate early results to make a convincing case for greater investment in bus service. So now for our hosts, um, today first we will have Julia Wallers, Wallers, the Boston Program Manager for ITDP US. She supports multiple areas of engagement in ITDP's Boston program, including piloting BRT elements along bus corridors in four municipalities. Julia is also the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee in Winthrop, Massachusetts, and serves as vice chair of the board of directors board of directors for the Livable Streets Alliance, an advocacy group that promotes innovative and equitable transport solutions in Metro Boston. Our second presenter today is Jay Monty, transportation planner for the city of Everett. Jay is the lead transportation planner for the city and is responsible for developing and carrying out the transportation vision, which includes an efficient multimodal transportation system and reducing automobile dependence for city residents. Besides designing and implementing the pop-up uh, pop bus lane, he is also continuing to retrofit Everett streets for better bus service with other elements of BRT and managing other transportation partnerships for infrastructure improvements, such as bus and ferry service for patrons and employees. In addition, Jake is, uh, Jay is also working to implement high quality cycling infrastructure. So now, Julia, I can hand off the presentation to you and you can feel free to share your screen. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Christina. Can everybody hear me okay? Christina, you got, you can hear me? Yes, it's clear. Okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. How are we looking? Uh, yes, I can see everything here. Excellent. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, this afternoon or this morning or evening, uh, wherever you are in the world. Um, I'm Julia Wallers, and as Katrina mentioned, I'm the Boston Program Manager here for ITDP. And uh, we have been working quite collaboratively and focused over the last couple of years on um, bus, bus pilots and sort of experiment with low cost but high impact improvements to local bus service, all in the name of improving uh, the transit experience and also elevating the concept of bus rapid transit and how to, uh, for lack of a, a better way to explain it, but how to make the bus the cool kid on the block again and really get us thinking more creatively and more boldly about how to leverage this part of our transit system as part of the solution, a uh, key part of the solution to congestion as well as meeting our climate goals. 
So I'm going to give you a little, I'll start by giving you a little background around how, how buses are and aren't working in Boston in the context of our uh, transportation crisis, and um, then a snapshot of how a multitude of municipalities have stepped up to the plate to test these uh, incremental improvements through what we're sort of calling quick build pilots uh, that have turned themselves into permanent, permanent projects with permanent impacts and investments. And um, then I will lend, hand it over to Jay, who will really tell you more of a narrative inside scoop story on the exciting improvements that have been happening and continue to happen in the city of Everett. So just a little context about why, why buses are important for Boston particularly. And the simplest answer is because they carry a lot of people every day. Over almost a half a million people ride buses throughout greater Boston. And while they make up about 30% of the total MBTA users, MBTA is our transit authority, the reliability and service levels lag severely behind that of the commuter rail and the subway. Um, on rail, trains generally arrive at about 90% on time. Whereas you look at the buses and they're not even meeting the T's own reliability targets. Only 14% of the time on the key routes and on more neighborhood serving routes, that reliability, they're on time about 9% of the time. So these buses are generally not not running well. At the same time, Boston was recently named the most congested city in the US. Uh, we have a lot of championship titles that we're proud of. Uh, congestion champ is not one of those. We've also been ranked the seventh most congested city in the world. So while our buses aren't running well, uh, no one is running well in Boston right now. Everyone is, is stuck in traffic. Um, but if you look at the analysis, it's really just seven miles of our streets that are holding back more than a fifth of our bus riders. Through all of this, there is, are severe implications on equity. Recent reports have found that Black riders spend 64 hours more per year on MBTA buses relative to their white riders. So that's a lot to chew on. Um, as I mentioned, buses experience a lot of delay. A lot of this is because of the congestion, um, but also just the way the buses are and aren't running. The picture on the right and the left both show in red where buses are being stuck in traffic. So this provides useful insights into where improvements would be necessary. This traffic is taking a big toll on bus riders. It's also very expensive for the T to, um, for these operating costs and the discre decreased service reliability for riders. The map on the left shows that dark, dark red uh, across the Tobin Bridge, which is where the, the 111 bus rides. The bus travels each day. It's the sixth busiest bus line in the system, and it can take upwards of 45 minutes to travel less than three miles. So while buses are stuck in traffic, they're also stuck at the station. A lot of the delay we found on our congested, most congested corridors, our buses are just over half of that delay is not even in traffic, just waiting for people to board. Just that whole process of being at the station takes a long time. Um, the riders themselves are face, facing some pretty poor conditions at the station and throughout the routes. And as I mentioned, the implications there on equity are significant. So can we do better in Boston? This is a, a question more and more people are starting to ask. And it's certainly the reason that we're here. ITDP is here in Boston because we think, yes, we can do better. Um, we do have a rapid bus line. The Silver Line was even dubbed BRT when it first launched. Uh, the biggest problem with this line is that it's stuck in traffic. Um, can we make these buses run better? Well, we're going to have to. We've got some big goals to meet. Big and I might, might add admirable goals. Um, Boston's own Go Boston 2030 plan, as well as the mayor's own climate plan, recent released, set a very ambitious target to cut car use in half by 2030. At the same time, increasing transit trips by 34%, walking and biking trips, all the while decreasing greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in the next 10 years and statewide 80% by 2050. So we got to get cracking on this stuff if we want to meet our goals. A lot of cities around the US have turned to BRT as a way to meet their goals, to cut greenhouse gas emissions and you know, make buses competitive again. You, if you're interested in learning more about this, we just recently released an implementation guide for US cities. You'll see on this map that Boston is not one of those cities. Um, we have investigated this, you know, could BRT bus rapid transit, the creme de la creme of bus service, could that work in Boston? Yes, we know that it could. Um, this study is online at bostonbrt.org. There are five prime corridors um, where bus rapid transit could work, but how you get from zero to BRT, it certainly doesn't happen overnight. We need to sort of generate momentum, build confidence, and test how elements of BRT could work in isolation to then inspire people to imagine what it would look like if we did all of them. So if we're to do BRT, we know we could cut travel times, that significant amount of delay, by upwards of 50%. 
But while we don't have BRT in Boston, we have an enormous onslaught of momentum around bus lane pilots. And I'm always proud to show this map, um, whereas it's always kind of sad to show, oh, Boston doesn't have BRT, but we have bus lane fever. And to add to this, um, two more lanes even have been implemented since this map was published just a couple of months ago. So these quick build bus lanes are definitely on the rise in Boston, and it's having an enormous impact for relatively low investments. Just a snapshot of these pilots. Oh, sorry for my news update there. Um, in communities from Arlington to the north, Broad Everett uh, to the east, and right in Boston, um, really just using cones, cops, and paint to, uh, to try new things, to, to get the bus out of traffic, to inspire people to take the bus and to feel better for making that choice to take the bus. So permanent improvements that also translate into permanent investments. And this is a map from the MBTA's bus, Better Bus Project to um, create measurable impacts. And the way buses run show that, you know, just in the last year, um, six projects, it's some of these lines uh, in 2019, I circled Arlington because that bus lane just became permanent a couple of weeks ago. So by the end, just by the beginning of 2020, we could be looking at upwards of 21 bus lane investment projects in the greater Boston region um, and over 10 miles of bus lanes, whereas just a few years ago, none of this was happening. So all this has happened in a relatively short period of time, which brings me to where a lot of this momentum came from was the Boston BRT local pilots in 2018. We affectionately like to call 2018 the year of the bus because this was truly the year where so much momentum was generated around bus priority and talking about buses differently. So Boston BRT is an initiative uh, funded through the Bar Foundation through their climate program. It's really what brought ITDP to Boston to begin with in 2013, starting with that um, BRT for Boston report. Um, which you know sort of was a study, sort of a technical analysis of can BRT work, to this then inspiring municipalities to to try things, to leverage um, these grants. So it was a competitive process um, that we put out for communities to step up to the plate and say, I am going to use this grant to do something that I might might not otherwise have had the resources to do in partnership with the T to test elements of bus rapid transit. So the communities that were part of these local pilots were Everett, Arlington, and Cambridge and Watertown. Um, Jay will tell you all the exciting things about Everett. All of these corridors are high capacity, high ridership, you know, boardings of over at least 10,000 per day, where there's also high levels of delay. So all of these programs um, shared the goals of not just accelerating the service, but also elevating the experiment, the experience. So testing elements of BRT. So instead of sort of seeming overwhelming, how do we get from zero to BRT? What if we just tested two of those elements, just, just a dedicated bus lane? Maybe we try some transit signal priority and then start imagining what would happen if we did all those things at once. And all of these, uh, like I said, we're on uh, corridors where the buses carry a lot of people and the people are stuck in traffic. So graphics like this are were really critical in showing just how inefficiently the current road space was being used. And I love this graphic from Cambridge um, illustrating that in a given time during rush hour, there are way more people in the buses. Um, over, the, over half the people on the road are in buses, but they're taking up just 3% of the space. So that lends itself to making the case for why that space should be reallocated to prioritize the people in the bus. So while our pilots all had uh, unique improvements, service improvements, we also had a unique branding system to make them distinct and approachable. Um, they had their own color scheme, their own little icons. And for the improvements that are sometimes are a little bit wonky or hard to understand, these sort of fun little icons to show people what, what is a dedicated lane, signal priority. And you see this icon, you sort of know what exactly the municipality is trying to do with this pilot. So these pilots are really collaborations, not just between the transit agency and the municipalities, but between the municipalities themselves. So we work together as a cohort to share plans, lessons learned, you know, tr to troubleshoot, to get best practices from around the country and around the world, both leading up to and during and after the pilots themselves. So that was a, a fun part of these. So getting into the, the first pilot that hit the ground in the fall, actually Everett, Everett was the first, and I'll let Jay tell you that story, but um, 
these are communities, Arlington is a community just north of Boston that previously did not have any sort of bus priority, but a huge volume of um, their commuters that take the bus, they don't have uh, the T station, they don't have the train. So this pilot, was the only one that actually had a beginning and an end date, one month duration. It was only during the morning commute, so that peak hour, 6 to 9 a.m., in one direction with the goal of not using any permanent construction, um, involving a lot of business and community engagement, a stakeholder process, and um, something that made this pilot unique was its tying it to the local sustainability goals because that was something around which there was already a lot of buy-in. So while this was a relatively small segment of roadway, it was still broken up into three segments in order to make it manageable and to really zero in on how the particular challenges in that part of the corridor were going to be addressed through the, um, the BRT pilot improvements. So the design elements that were explored and implemented in this pilot, um, obviously the most visible is always the dedicated bus lane, transit signal priority to get the bus through the intersection quicker. Um, in this case, bus stop relocation, so the bus wasn't didn't get stuck at the red light when crossing a, a key intersection, and queue jump lanes to really you know bump that bus through the intersection quickly, so it didn't have to get stuck in line. So the final design, I'm going to break into three into three portions, and I should add that all this came out of extensive regular meetings with the business community, with local neighborhood associations, and um, the elected and volunteer committees throughout the community. Um, that first one, so it really addressed the issues at this particular intersection, was to move the bus to the other side of the intersection. Um, the most controversial is always the issue of parking, restricting, uh, we call it temporarily, dis temporarily displacing parking in the morning. Um, it wasn't as many spaces as some would have liked. You can see the queue goes quite quite a lot further back on the road than where the queue jump starts, but it was enough to improve how the bus ran without upsetting the businesses too much. It's always a bit of a fine line to walk and as well as incorporating transit signal priority. The most notable portion of the, the segment was the curbside bus lane, um, just under a, just about a quarter mile where the parking study was conducted showed that during this time of the day, 6 to 9 a.m., not a lot of people were needing to park on this stretch of the roadway, so not a high volume, not a high return way to use this valuable curb space. So restricting that parking, creating a bus lane, unfortunately it did involve removing a curb extension in one part. Um, and then finally, quite extensive alterations to this intersection because of the high vehicular volumes in the morning. So we wanted to, it was very important to make sure that we didn't have negative impacts on traffic and generate um, a bad feeling about bus priority. So we wanted to make this to be a success. It was just one month. So to ensure that it would become permanent, we needed to take extra care to make sure that overall traffic flow on the corridor continued to work. And that was done again through a collaboration with right on the other side of this intersection is Cambridge. So there was two communities having to talk, which doesn't always happen here in New England. Um, and as also with DCR who owns this Elwick Brook Parkway. So a lot of stakeholders at the table um, changing the way the bus could travel, shared right straight uh, turns, and a split phase eastbound approach with a shared left movement. And I would be remiss, remiss if I did not mention this partnership with local artists. Um, as I mentioned, these pilots were not just about the experience of riding the bus, but also the experience of waiting for the bus, of getting for the bus. So these beautiful installations that really um, made made the experience glow so art brt was a, a really fun element to bring a more human-centered approach to these so how did it go well in a nutshell uh, the buses ran a lot faster no surprise you take the bus out of traffic and get where it's going a lot more quickly on average uh, about five minutes faster but through our survey and we knew that that five minutes felt like a lot more. So people would say that they thought they saved, you know, 10 to 12 minutes because the experience was so much better. So we're cutting travel times in half, but also improving the way people feel about that experience. So they didn't just run more quickly, they were also more consistent. So decreasing the variability, people knew that if they stepped outside their door at 8 a.m., it would take them five to seven minutes rather than maybe 11 minutes, maybe 17. You can plan your schedule more um, more consistent and more reliably. And people approved. Uh, there was extensive amount of surveying, almost 1,000 people were questioned, including a lot of drivers. And through that all, um, over 70% said, yes, you should bring this lane back. And in fact, it should be made longer. 
So across the modes, people felt very positive, lending itself to one year later, this, this lane becoming permanent. You can see the use of paint. And there were no more, no more cones, no more cops, just you know, sort of building this into one police uh, man's rotation in the morning. Um, is how the permanent implementation went. Um, I love this picture at the bottom that shows actually from a drone, sort of looks like this red carpet being laid for the bus throughout the community. And again, more community meetings um, to make this pilot now a permanent fixture of the community of Arlington. Just around the same time, Cambridge and Watertown launched their pilot on Mount Auburn Street. And uh, contrary to Arlington, there was never an end date. It was always meant to sort of be evolving. And if it didn't work, they would just make tweaks. And there were no time restrictions on the, imp the um, improvements that they implemented. Mount Auburn Street, for those who aren't familiar, is a very, uh, very busy roadway consisting of major health institutions, educational institutions, and over 12,000 people riding buses and over 19,000 vehicles. So the buses experienced delays, but also there were some pretty significant pedestrian issues. So with this pilot, um, parking was not so much an issue because there was no curbside parking. Um, they did not use, they just, no construction, just paint, flex posts and signs, a lot of education, and again, no end dates. It was always evolving with an enormous amount of stakeholders. Again, with this roadway, there were multiple agencies and multiple municipalities that needed to be at the table to be discussing in real time how this project was playing out. The key elements here was the shared bus bike lane, transit signal priority, queue jumps. So where a bus lane is not feasible, is there a way to get the bus through the intersection more quickly with the queue jump? So vehicles can turn right, but the bus can cruise on through the intersection. These were some of the key elements of this pilot. And as I mentioned, the pedestrian crossings was a big deal. And it made a difference, it makes a difference to frame these pilots, not just about the bus, but about the overall corridor. Is it working for everyone who travels? And again, with this pilot, yes, buses ran a lot faster with these lanes, with the service improvements. Um, numbers like this, buses, people on the buses saving 36,000 hours a year. Um, and I should note with no measurable impacts to people who are driving. So we're making the bus run better without without impeding on other people in other modes. And again, with this pilot, people really liked it. It was always framed as how do you like the street overall, not just these particular elements of how the bus is running, but across the modes, people felt very favorably about how modern Auburn Street worked from just 80.6% to over half of people saying, you know what, this corridor works for me. I'm gonna come here more often. I might even take the bus more often too. Um, some of our favorite quotes just from the survey, and there were some great banners along the along this corridor so that it wasn't just about riding the bus, but just seeing, you know, the messaging, everyone for bus rapid transit for everyone, the branding was very important. Um, one of my favorite quotes is someone said, I think this project might be too successful. That's never a bad thing. So key to this, this success was the coordination frequently, a lot of outreach, um, being flexible, you know, making lemonade where you need to and exploring unconventional sources of data. So little snapshots of those pilots. Um, the first one that hit the ground was in Everett and I'm happy to hand it over to my colleague, Jay Monty to tell you that story. All right, so here we go. Uh, again, my name is Jay Monty. I'm the transportation planner for the city of Everett and um, been here for five years now. Um, and we're a city that's really in transformation on, on many levels, um, which I'll talk about a bit more. And so we're really excited to have partnered with uh, Julia and ITDP um, and, and many other community partners to really try to push the envelope and see um, through you know, incremental projects through transformational projects, how we can actually change the discussion, how we can change the, the paradigm of mobility in, in our city. And just to tell you a little bit about Everett, um, we're three miles from downtown Boston, um, so very close. Um, but as you see the map down here, we're geographically isolated by uh, several rivers. And so the actual number of routes in and out of Boston and Cambridge, where the, the job centers, the education centers are, um, are really only two or three primary routes. And that means our transit riders, our um, you know, vehicle drivers, everybody is really congested onto these, these few routes. Um, and we are a transit dependent population. So um, of our 45, 50,000 
residents. Uh, we have 15,000 daily boardings and alightings uh, in the city of Everett. And we have seven bus routes. Um, and we have no rapid transit, as in no trains, no trolleys, and no key bus routes. Key bus routes, by the way, are just um, buses that the uh, MBTA, the transit agency, um, essentially you can walk out to a bus stop and there's going to be a bus coming every five minutes, six minutes, but you treat it almost like um, doesn't need a schedule. Uh, so we have none of those in the city. We, we come close with some of our, our routes, but, but not quite there. Um, and some of this context is important too uh, about governance of the region and how transit is provided because um, unlike some cities uh, in the Western United States or other cities around the world where, um, you know, Boston geographically is not all that large. And so the Boston metro area is actually contained of um, dozens of independent cities and towns. And within that, the MBTA the, the, is the service provider um, running um, their vehicles on streets owned by cities and towns. And so um, the MBTA cannot uh, unilaterally change you know, lane configurations. They don't do construction on city streets. And so the cities and towns have a very large role to play um, in, in how the bus systems operate. Um, we have a very, re very weak regional planning structure. Um, we do have a regional planning agency, but they are not, uh, they don't have really a whole lot of teeth in terms of um, kind of dictating policy and planning to the city and towns. Um, and then within these many cities and towns, we have varying forms of municipal government. So um, here in Everett, we have a strong mayoral, mayoral system um, but just across the river in Cambridge, they have a strong city council system. And the two, you know, these different types of governances uh, strongly affect the process um, that you may go through to plan and implement a project. Um, and they certainly uh, influence uh, all kinds of policy uh, decisions as well. So uh, this all started back in 2016. And this was uh, well before the other pilots that uh, Julia had discussed came about. And so we're, we're a city in transformation. So um, we're, we're starting to gentrify. We have a lot of uh, new development. We have uh, right now in the pipeline, a thousand units of, of housing in the, in the development pipeline. Um, we just opened a major new resort casino um, that uh, brings a visiting population greater than the city on some days. So um, we're, we're dealing with a lot. And um, of course we can't, expand our roadways. We don't want to expand our roadways. And we've really, we're really trying to change the discussion into um, mobility as opposed to, um, you know, congestion uh, of vehicles. And we worked with the Mass uh, Department of Transportation starting in 2015 to build this uh, transit action plan. Uh, the idea was to look at how is transit operating in the city of Everett? Um, what are the demographics currently? What are the demographics uh, going to look like in 10 and 20 years? Um, and what could the service look like in 10 and 20 years? But beyond just that, you know, there's been this tendency, I think, historically to look at um, these, these one-off transformational projects, extending a subway, um, adding a train station, things of that nature. And what we really wanted was a plan that the city could take action on individually. So as I said earlier, um, you know, the city owns the roads. We own most of the infrastructure. It's really incumbent upon us to make many of the changes, and we wanted a plan that would reflect that, and that's what we we work to, uh, to, to uh, develop. So at this point, um, we report was released in 2016. Uh, we had uh, tiers of projects. And so we had, of course, we had some, you know, big aspirational projects, uh, you know, ranging from train stations and subways and things like that. But on the, on the, on the other end, we had, um, we called them all hanging fruit. So again, projects that we could, could do quickly. And, um, you know, there had been talk about doing uh, transit priority lanes. Uh, nobody had really taken the the first step to do it, and we decided to be that, that city that was going to take that first step. Um, so we we did the pilot, and uh, it was a little bit of an accident in the way it happened. So um, I think initially we thought we were going to take six or eight months, really do a, a, a detailed um, planning analysis, engineering analysis, and uh, and have something with paint and um, you know traffic devices to to really make it make it a a full-fledged uh, bus lane. We also had the thought that if this is really going to be impactful, and we believed it would be impactful, that we wanted to take the same number of buses that were currently running on the corridor 
with the hope that if they're running faster, they can run more trips and we can build capacity into the system. And as we had conversations with um, the MBTA as to how we might do that, they said, well, you know, it's October, November. And if you're thinking about spring, um, we actually need to have our schedule built by uh, December and January. And that left us in a little bit of a, a conundrum. And we said, well, I'll tell you what, if we give you a lane of traffic for four or five days, we'll put out some cones, we'll make it look like a construction zone, we'll disguise it. We're not even going to do it, an outreach process, but it's enough for you to run the buses for a couple of days, gather some data, tell us if this is going to work or not, and then we'll take the winter to, to plan it out. And that's what we did. Um, but as it turned out, it was wildly successful enough that we never stopped. And so, um, you know, I think we broke the traditional process in a sense. Uh, we, we hadn't done um, a lot of public outreach. We hadn't done evening meetings. We hadn't done a whole lot of notice really to anybody. Um, and essentially what we realized is we're using the pilot as the process, right? We actually were able to engage uh, many, many more people by building this, this pilot that, you know, if it didn't work on day one, it would not have run on day two, but since it worked that first day, it came back the second day. And because it worked the second day, it came back the third day. And all that time we were gathering input from um, bus riders, from drivers. We used the city's constituent services um, system to really try to solicit uh, comments. Um, and so we, we sort of accidentally, accidentally built this pilot into its own sort of process that um, in some way circumvented sort of the traditional uh, things we often do uh, when we plan projects. But uh, it, it actually turned out to work uh, fairly well. And on the third day, the, the mayor was so excited, he decided we were going to um, keep doing this indefinitely. And so we uh, we did just that. Um, now, there are a lot of coordination and logistics, um, obviously. So we had to remove 200 parking spaces every morning. Um, and we did so by placing cones on the road. That means we had to have a, a crew out there placing cones, picking them up um, if they got knocked over. Um, we had to have parking enforcement. Um, and part of the reason we did it the way we did it um, was that we, we needed to use existing practices. So part of the, the logic of doing the pilot is that it's not resource intensive. Um, especially for a small city like us, we don't have millions of dollars to uh, necessarily put towards a major project, especially if we're not sure if it's going to work. Um, so we had to think, okay, parking enforcement, well, we do have other parking staff. They'd be typically doing street sweeping enforcement at the time, but okay, for this week, we're going to put them on uh, bus lane duty. Um, you know, DPW knows how to set up a construction zone. So if we make the bus lane look like a construction zone and act like a construction zone, um, not only will the DPW know how to build that, but drivers will also know um, how to, how to the world. The, the businesses don't go, go under and go bankrupt. Everything's really going to be fine. And that, and that proves to be the case as well. Um, and then certainly with, on the uh, MBTA and, and Mass DOT side, they had their own, um, you know, list of things that they, they need to do. So um, notifying the drivers. So um, these drivers are showing up that first morning and, and quite honestly, half of them didn't even know they were supposed to be in the bus lane. So we had staff out there to direct them in and making sure they were, they were using it. Um, and of course, notifying the riders too, that we were um, trying something different. So you'll see the service advisory on the right. Um, usually you'll see these in subway stations and, and bus stops is when they're, uh, closing something or something's going to be late or, or not come at all. And um, we're, we're kind of proud that on this particular one, it says the bus might be coming early. So that was um, something, something a little fun to have. Uh, another big piece of this was um, telling the story and having the um, press and public relations aspect. Um, that was something we did internally. Um, and this didn't start out all that positively. So we, um, the week before we launched the pilot, we, got the paper involved. They said, we're going to do this. And just, could you, could you let folks know? And you'll see the date on that first one is December 2nd. Um, well, that article didn't come off so well. We had some city councilors who got a little upset and some businesses who got vocal. Um, but the bus lane launched on December 6th. So four days later. Um, and by December 23rd, the same paper, the same writer uh, on the right-hand side, is stating that the dedicated bus lane could be a model statewide, and indeed, indeed it was. Um, so I think what we were trying to do here is start to um, make an effort that we, we're we going to try to shape the story of how this goes. Um, you know, it's very easy when you when you uh, do initial outreach, your folks are, are nervous, they're, it's, it's change, you know, everybody kind of 
is, is anxious about change. Um, I think the pilot sort of required folks to, um, you know, balance their their fears with reality a bit. And so, um, you know, we 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 through kind of shaping the stories through being a little bit in people's faces a little bit, but but also we had we did our job to make sure we created a, a pilot and a product that was um, you know, not not harming people. Uh, I, don't, I don't think in a, in a um, largely negative way. If you weren't, you know, a bus rider, certainly if you are a bus rider, you're getting quite a benefit. And very quickly, um, you know, word was getting out about this pilot, and um, the Globe picked it up a couple weeks later. Um, City Lab uh, wrote a nice piece on this a few months later, and uh, as we see on the bottom, um, you know, folks really became satisfied, and, and that's not just riders; that was drivers who um, had the perception that. Uh, the bus was no longer in their way, pulling in, in and out of traffic. Um, and as Julia said too, you know, riders generally um, thought they were saving more time than they were actually saving. So that perception of, of how this was operating was was very positive. Um, by the next fall, we had um, finally made it permanent. We weren't really ready to go through the winter with the cones and kind of the, the day to day, but we did. And uh, by the next next fall, we were able to get the paint on the road and, and make it make it permanent. And here you see the, the finished condition uh, a year later. One of the things we did on this project too that was not done elsewhere in the Boston region was we combined buses and bikes. Um, this road didn't have a bike lane previously. Um, and general consensus was from the MBTA, from bike riders was don't mix buses and bikes. It's a bad idea. Um, there's gonna be accidents. There's too many conflicts. Um, since we didn't already have a bike lane what we really had at the start was a bus lane and a vehicle lane. And pretty much overnight, the bikes on the corridor um, gravitated into the bus lane. And they found it was actually a fairly high quality facility to ride in. And that actually the running speeds of buses and bikes, at least on this corridor, were similar enough that the um, risk of conflict was very low. Um, so we, we, when we painted the road a year later, we did implement a shared bus bike lane um, that's since been copied uh, elsewhere, and I think folks have generally gotten on board. It, it's, it doesn't work everywhere. If you have high-speed traffic, if you have a lot of buses, um, I sure I may not recommend this the same treatment, but uh, in our case, it has worked out uh, very well. So uh, another year later, and uh, we're ready to do the next step. We're ready to um, try the next pilot and uh, enter uh, the Bar Foundation and uh, ITDP. And uh, they solicited the, the uh, RFP that Cambridge and Arlington and, and Watertown all responded to. We, we wanted to stay in the game. We wanted to keep this, this momentum going. Um, and we'd already done now the bus lane. We were implementing signal priority on our own. Um, really of the remaining types of elements we could do, um, one of them was uh, the level boarding. The idea being that if you raise the sidewalk up to the door of the bus, um, you can speed boarding, you can ease boarding. And, um, and that's what we decided we were going to we were going to do. Uh, so thanks to uh, Julia's team and, and the Bar Foundation, they funded our our grant request, and we built uh, two level boarding uh, installations. And you see the one here on the left. Um, we also have the the branded um, experience of the the t-shirts and the logos uh, that ITDP helped to create as well. Um, and here's the platform going in. So. Um, we really didn't know how we were going to do this when we first applied. And after talking to some folks around other cities, they pointed me to this product called uh, the Zikla Vectorial uh, Platform. And Zikla is a company out of Spain. They produced this modular, almost look like Legos, uh, this platform. And really what it's meant for is doing um, bus bulb outs. So um, moving the bus station out into the streets, so the bus didn't have to pull over. So it's roughly the same height as a sidewalk. And you can, the nice thing about it is you can build it to any shape because it's, it's square blocks. You can, you can fit any um, size that you need. And uh, we talked to the MBTA. We measured the heights of the bus doors. And we got to thinking that, hey, if you just stack this on top of the sidewalk, you'll actually be uh, pretty close to the height of the, the door of the bus. Um, and so you can see here on the bottom right, a gentleman with a walker. And, and he's able now to um, just roll his walker right onto the bus. You know, previously, if he was stepping up from the curb, uh, that's quite a, an exercise to try to lift your walker, stroller, um, you know, grocery cart, um, whatever it may be, up onto the bus. Um, so this is, you know, somebody who has really benefited from the uh, aspect of level boarding. 
Um, but it's not just about the technical elements because we're not trying to just engage folks who are on the bus. We want we need we need the support of everybody in the community to um, really change again the way we think about mobility and the way we think about transit and think about the bus. Um, so part of this grant uh, funded um, the art installations that Julia talked about in Arlington. In Everett, we went and did this flower bomb, and, and this is the artist here who, who um, installed the flower bomb in the photo, um, trying to turn the bus stop into a real place. And I, I always like to compare, um, you think of the great places in the world sometimes are actually transportation facilities, Grand Central Station in New York, um, you know, Penn Station, um, they function as much more than simply a place to get on and off uh, a piece of transportation. And I think that's what we're trying to recreate here. We, we use the fire bomb as a way to create a place that the community uh, could feel proud of, could uh, interact with and experience. And I think we were successful in that um, for the couple of days that it was up. Uh, we had folks coming from not only all around Everett, but all around the region coming to get their photos taken um, in the bus stop fire bomb. And so that was uh, really, I think, one of the highlights of our, our project. Um, and of course, beyond that, we've got, uh, you know, the idea of turning this into an event. So the day we launched, um, we made sure it was a, an event. We had a ribbon cutting down on the bottom left with the mayor, um, Secretary Pollock um, from, from MassDOT, the head of the MBTA. Um, so we really made this something, again, that um, I think it goes a long way when uh, folks can feel proud of the projects that are going on in the city, even if they don't uh, necessarily benefit from them personally. But, um, you know, a city like Everett, which uh, historically had been, um, you know, low income, industrial, uh, not a place that was on the cutting edge of a lot, uh, to now be in this position where we're um, kind of leading the charge on um, improving bus service, improving transit, um, is I think a point of pride to a lot of folks. And you see that coming out um, in discussions on planning boards and, um, you know, community meetings and so forth. So um, every time we, we sort of go beyond just making it a piece of transportation, but also making it an event, making it a uh, point of pride um, that goes a long way into sort of furthering the, the momentum. And, uh, you know, as we've, as we've continued that momentum, it, we, have, we eventually have to go from what's a pilot to what's permanent. And so um, just last week, we opened our first permanent uh, level boarding platform. Uh, this time we did it in concrete. So it's not quite as flashy as the, uh, the Zikla uh, uh, blocks. But uh, just as functional, you see on the top right, somebody getting off the bus. Um, and we're, we're building three more of these uh, in the next year. And it's going to become the city standard for all bus stops going forward. And the next four or five years, we'll probably have uh, close to two dozen of these on city streets. We've also put in uh, real-time information at some of our busier bus stops. So on the bottom left here, it's hard to see, but um, it's called a SUPA sign and SUPA um, They've been installing these signs around the Boston area, I think in other, other cities as well. As well. Um, the top portion of the sign is an electronic black and white uh, message board. Uh, they have community information, uh, they have uh, some advertising, and then the bottom third there has the bus routes and their um, predicted arrival times. And on the bottom right, which you can't really see well, we've installed bike sharing stations at some of our key stations as well. Uh, in this case, it's empty, so I think that's a good thing. Uh, I took that this morning, so everybody had taken a bike and gone to work, and uh, hopefully it'll fill back up in the afternoon. Uh, and then here's the big one that we're really thinking about for next year uh, to, to move this forward. Um, we really believe that in the long run, um, the right decision is to go to a center running um, bus rapid transit alignment on Broadway. Um, and we feel that this is a concept we probably need to prove before we take the plunge and do it um, in really a, a major way. So our thought is, can we do this as a pilot? And um, you'll see this graphic here, sort of the, the first concept sketch of what that might look like um, with vehicle traffic running on either side of the, the bus lane, bus lane is in red, and we've got to create these floating uh, bus stops that will uh, be kind of down the middle of the road, located roughly at the existing bus stops today, but need to be near crosswalks and intersections so we can uh, create the connectivity. Um, so this is still very early. Um, we haven't really fully baked this yet, but uh, something that we're we're excited to think about real, real hard over the winter and hopefully put on the street next year. Um, and this gets back to, I think, why do we do the pilot process and the pilot projects? Um, it creates a real time public process that informs a larger transformational project or policy. Uh, this graphic on the screen here 
uh, was produced by ITDP. Um, to look at, okay, what does what really does full-on center-running BRT look like on a street like Broadway, which is not a wide street, as you have seen from the photos. Um, we don't have six or eight or ten lanes to work with. We have two lanes and, and two parking lanes. And so um, in some ways that makes it very difficult. In some ways I think it actually makes it very easy. Um, but I would dare say that this graphic would not have uh, even been plausible or um, have even been entertained by folks in, in the city had we not started with these smaller pilot um, projects that start to get folks' minds turning and thinking, um, hey, we can do this differently. We can think differently about our street. And, um, oh, yeah, we did a bus lane. So, yeah, we, why, don't, why not take the next step? And why not make a center running? Why not um, build a nice station? Things like that. So, um, you know, we really believe that these incremental changes can lead to much larger um, transformations of policies and projects. Um, you know, I think looking at how we got to where we are with vehicle dependency and single occupancy vehicles, um, certainly there was some, there were transformational projects. There were the interstate highways and the major highway projects of the 60s and 70s, but a lot of it was also incremental as well. You know, taking a few feet of curb for an extra parking space, you know, pushing a curb back, narrowing a sidewalk to make the turn lane. You know, those things happened time and time and time again um, without really a lot of thought as to what that was going to add up to. And what's added up to now is the congestion, uh, the pollution um, and, and the, you know, degradation of other forms of mobility. I think if we look at um, these smaller pilot projects, whether they be, they be bus or bike, making these small incremental changes over time um, will will get us to the larger transformation of, of how we view mobility. Um, so that's how we really view it here. Um, and, you know, again, public perception and accountability. So, um, you know, we've all been in the public meetings where Folks make a lot of claims about what they think a new project is going to do or not do. Um, and the reality is, is that a lot of times you can't hold yourself or anybody else accountable to that statement, right? If somebody says it's going to cause traffic, that's going to, you know, uh, destroy my quality of life, you know, what do you really have to, to, to say it, it will or it won't? Um, I think what the pilot does is it holds not only um, those types of public comments accountable, but also holds the public sector accountable. So if we're going to do a pilot, project of, of a bus lane or a bus stop, um, we've got to make it work. So we've got to prove that it does work and that it is a positive impact to the quality of life. Um, and if it doesn't, we won't succeed. Uh, but at the same time, I think uh, we're able to uh, shape the discussion in a way that um, everybody's comments, everybody's discussion is, is a little more accountable. Um, and, and if it doesn't work, we, we pull it out and we, and we try something else. But, um, you know, this, this really has let us try some new things that um, I think we're folks are very fearful to try before. Um, so again, just some takeaways to think about um, the pilot as the public process. We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, utilizing existing practices. Some of you on the line may be from major cities. You may have lots of resources. I'm guessing there's plenty of you on the line that work for smaller cities and towns. You don't have tens of millions of dollars to, um, to play with. You you aren't able to um, transform you know the structure of city hall to implement um, you know, a new transit project. But if you can think of how you might do a pilot and use the existing knowledge, the, the existing practices, um, you'll actually be able to do more than, than you think you might be able to do. Um, perception is important as, is, is as important as reality. Um, you know, ultimately it's perception that drives political decisions and um, you know, these projects live and die on, on politics in, in many cases. So. Um, creating that positive perception um, is, is just as important as the, the real effects. Uh, fringe benefits to other modes. I think one of the things that we've really tried to do um, with our pilots is um, create some little benefit, even if you aren't taking the bus. Um, wasn't always what we planned. Like I said, we weren't expecting drivers to really care one way or the other, but it turns out they felt that they got a benefit because the bus was not pulling in the traffic. So that was a, uh, a benefit that, came back and uh, helped us with the, the bus pilot. Um, you know, the, the shared bus and bike lane um, ultimately was able to get the cycling community on board with this type of project. Um, so at the end, I think if you're making it just a bus project or, or just a bike project, I, I don't know that you're going to have the same level of success if you're, unless you're able to show everybody that you've uh, benefited their quality of life. Um, don't expect perfection. So 
this is the whole point of a pilot, right? You're going to figure it out along the way. Um, we, I think as planners fall into this trap a lot of, you know, we haven't figured out every single problem and how to solve it before we put this on the street, um, then we can't move forward. Well, I think, you know, especially with a pilot process, it allows you to put something on the street that is um, maybe a little less than perfect, but as long as you're in a position and a mindset that you're going to make the changes needed to make it work, um, you'll succeed. And, and, and again, the steady incremental change leads to transformation. I think this is our, our, our mantra along with pilot as a public process um, as to how we're, we're doing things here at Everett. Um, so uh, glad I could talk to you all today. And here's my email and contact info if anybody would like to chat more. And with that, I will hand it back to Christina and Julia. Great. Thank you so much, Jay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and dive into the questions that have been submitted here. The first one was submitted by Cassie. Considering the fact that Boston has some of the worst congestion, can you speak to how you are enforcing the quick build and permanent bus only lanes? Are you considering pushing for enabling legislation for camera enforcement? I'm going to uh, ping Julia for that question, if that's okay. Sure. <clears throat> can you can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So yeah, I, I mistakenly answered this uh, during the presentation via text uh, as I was watching it come in. But yeah, it's a great question. Um, ultimately, bus lanes without you know physical separation are only as as effective as their enforcement. And enforcement is a huge issue for all of the bus lanes, um, and it it really varies by municipality um, on how how much police resource um, is put put into it um, in a lot of cases depending on the design there's been some like there was um, a pilot on Brighton Ave recently that launched this past spring that uses a travel lane and vehicles have to cross over it to get to the parking lane and uh, the the city has said that just the headache of enforcing that has perhaps even trumped the benefits of having the lane um, Whereas some of it is also just behavioral and educating people and making sure, you know, the paint is bright and that people respect it. But enforcement is huge if there's no physical separation. Um, so definitely something that's had to be addressed aggressively for all of these pilots. Um, Twitter is also an effective tool um, of people sort of, you know, taking pictures of cars behaving badly and traveling in the bus lanes. Um, as far as uh, legislation for camera enforcement, um, that's part of the hands-free driving legislation that's being considered, but specific to bus lanes. Um, it's not something that, that we have developed any legislation for at this time. So if I could speak to that a little bit too, um, and this goes back to sort of the governance structure as well in, in the Boston area, which makes it very difficult here where um, you have a state agency running vehicles on city streets. And so, um, you know, you, you have this issue where, um, you know, here state police don't issue tickets on city roadways and the kind of the same situation of having a um, state agency vis-a-vis -a, -vis a bus issuing a ticket on city streets. Um, whether or not legislation could solve that easily here is, I think, a big question. Um, certainly in other cities where, um, you know, the city may operate the buses, that's a much easier question to solve. What I will add is that one of the reasons for wanting to go to center running alignments are that it reduces a lot of those types of conflicts. Um, mm -hmm. So um, if you push moving traffic to the curb, um, you really can't pull over, you can't park, um, you can't make drop offs very easily. And that, you know, by nature gives a bus, um, you know, a much clearer right of way down the middle. Uh, we have one parking enforcement officer that patrols the lane um, and does a decent job. I mean, they don't get everybody. Um, and again, back to the issue of you know, perfection. If we had gone into this thinking that we were going to keep every car out of that bus lane, um, well, that just wasn't realistic. But the bus can go around the occasional car if it has to. Um, it's not the end of the world. And, um, you know, if we can get, you know, 80, 90 percent compliance in the bus lane, I think we're, we're still getting most of the benefit. Um, I didn't mention to everybody that, uh, you know, we did still have, even with the imperfections, a 30 percent time savings in run times. And we've grown ridership by 5%, uh, and that's in the face of um, overall MBTA bus ridership dropping 3%. So, you know, I think even with these issues, these imperfections that I think are valid, um, don't let that stop you from, um, you know, doing something like this, because I think you'll still get a lot of the benefit. 
Great, thank you, Jay. Um, this next series of questions, I'm actually going to bundle together and, and point to you, Jay. So um, if you look towards the bottom, Pierre may ask, how long did the planning process take before implementation of these pilots? And what I'd like to add to that are two other questions that people submitted, uh, which is with the transit agency, uh, did you hire engineers um, uh, consult as consultants to design these pilots or was it from the transit authority itself? And also what is the recommended best length of time for the pilot project seeing that you all initially started out with a shorter time and then it was extended indefinitely by the mayor? Hmm. Uh, so let's go back to the first one, which was said again. It was um, how long did it take the planning process before implementing right. and within that, um, did you hire um, external engineers to do the design so, or was that within the transit agency? Yeah, so in this area across the different communities and, and Julia can better speak to Arlington and Cambridge, but uh, we didn't. I mean, we really, we really had very little process. Um, the we, pilot we is a public process. The, <laughs> the, the pilot is a public process. I think, I think that's the important Forever. point. Yeah. Um, but uh, we, you know, we started this and we weren't in that mindset just yet. We sort of justified it by saying, well, well, it's just a week. Um, and, you know, we also just did this whole transit study where we did do quite a bit of outreach. Uh, we did lots of serving of riders and the public and we had community meetings and, and all of that. So, um, you know, this was part of that. This was discussed as, as a near term project. And so we felt that that was um, enough to go on and then say, well, the pilot is really the process from here on out. Um, and so that's to answer that part of the question. I think it took us from the time the report came out, which was October, November, we implemented, we implemented this in December. Um, so if you look at it from that perspective, we were about a month from mm -hmm. um, deciding to do this to actually doing it. And most of that was just getting all the players, you know, lined up, ready to go, getting the coordination of the city departments ready to go, ordering cones, you know, all the, all the, just the logistics. Um, but it really wasn't planning process per se. Mm -hmm. um, what was the last part of that question? Engineering, right? We hired an engineer. So yes. uh, no, we didn't on this project. Um, other projects did. Um, my background is in highway design. So, um, you know, in, in some sense to the level, this wasn't a really complex project. I was able to do it on my own. Um, you know, certainly as we move to the center running concept, um, we will you know, have a, a consulting firm help us with that because there are some you know, bigger safety uh, concerns that go along with that. Yeah, if, if you don't mind uh, adding to that, I would just say that both the timeline and the level of consultant and uh, professional consult, uh, engineer involvement varies pretty dramatically across the municipalities, depending on their local capacity and resources. Um, as a general measure for the other pilots, six to nine months was based sort of the lead up for design and public outreach. And the level of public outreach looks different across municipalities, depending on their you know, governmental structure and also public process expectation. Um, Everett was definitely a unique, unique case with the expediency of not hosting a lot or, or really any nighttime meetings or neighborhood specific meetings. Um, where in Cambridge, it was six months of you know, weekly or even bi-weekly meetings in different neighborhoods with different stakeholders and um, same with, with Arlington. So it definitely depends on the community. Um, in the case of Boston BRT, uh, with, these, with these particular pilots, we had some engineer professionals uh, on our team, on our consultant team, and the municipalities were able to use parts of their grant to bring in additional consultants. Um, and somebody had asked about, you know, the branding and graphic design, and that was all part of what we offered. Um, but, uh, you know, as these pilots have continued to unfold and, you know, unleash this momentum towards more communities trying things like this, it's sort of sped up the time because, you know, we know it works. We know people like this stuff, so it doesn't need to be quite as drawn out. It's, it's not perceived as such a risk. Um, so communities are able to act more swiftly. Great, thank you, Julia. And um, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to go through these remaining questions, but if it's okay to you, Julia and Jay, I can bundle some of them together and we can see if we could prepare some responses uh, for the remaining unanswered questions from today's session. Yeah, 
I have a few extra minutes now if you do want to answer some more if you folks are willing to stick around. So either way. Okay. Um, yeah. yeah, I'll go ahead and, and bundle them because we have everyone's email captured. So we okay. can make answer them for folks. Great. So thank you to everyone again, especially especially to Julie and Jay for um, your presentations today. And also, I just like to thank our attendees for, for interacting with us and for being at today's webinar to learn about um, these bus pilots, but also how these are scalable and could be used in the city that you're living in and in the cities that you're working in. And as mentioned earlier, the PowerPoint and recording will be shared with you via email and it will also be hosted on the ITDP website. So again, thank you all for joining and we hope to see everyone online again soon. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks, Christina. Thank you. Take care.